Today's conversation is with Reverend Deborah Bishop, affectionately known as Rev Deb. She tells us to dare to be ourselves. And we deep dive into one of her favorite sayings, you will never outperform your own self. What does that mean? What does it mean to play big? Rev Dev answers those questions and much more. Is it any wonder that she is one of the 25 women that Womel is celebrating the month of March, 2021? Welcome to Her Business, Her Voice, Her Conversation. This podcast was created for the boomer woman leaving corporate, and now you're looking to reinvent yourself, become an author, an entrepreneur, a podcaster. Well, each episode will leave you with clarity. You will come away with the yes, I can, and yes, I will reinvent myself mindset. So come on, let's do this. I'm your host, Margot Levesque. Hello, everyone. Margot Levette back. Yes, you know we've been talking about 25 influential women, powerful women. They made the list for Womel Magazine, and I've had the honor, the awesome privilege to interview each and every one of them. And it is a thrill again, because today's conversation is with an inspiration performance artist. Can't wait to hear more about that. She's a talk radio, TV talk show host, and a non-denominational minister, Reverend Deborah Bishop. And she gave me permission to call her Rev Deb. So Rev Deb, thank you for joining me right now, right here. Oh, thank you so much, Margo, for having me. I'm really excited to be here and really honored to be uh, named uh, as amongst all of what's happening with Womel or Wom Lead, as it's now called these days, um, I've been really thrilled to be involved with the magazine for for a while now. Yes, yes. Well, that I re- I read your articles there, and that's mm-hmm. how I feel as though I know you. People need to know that your digital fo- footprint goes deep, as does your print footprint. You've been a writer for Womel Wom Lead for a couple of years now, yes. correct? Yeah. Wow. And I meaty, hearty, giving articles. So I just want everyone to to realize that they're not dealing with a novice right here. No, not at all. But my first question to you is that on your on your website, you say you will never outperform your own self image Mm -hmm. that caught my eye that caught my ear. What does that mean? And what did how does a woman apply that? that idea. Got it. Uh, That's really my point of view. Everything I do is based off this idea that you'll never outperform your own self-image or another way of putting it, you will never outperform the very things you believe to be true about yourself. So as a woman, and I mean, as a man as well, as a human being, really, we have these ideas of, of who we think we are. And they're influenced by our youngest years of life because those are our most impressionable years of life. And we go through something that I call the formation of a foundational lie. And during that time, we often are experiencing something that doesn't feel quite right or normal to us, whatever that may be. It doesn't feel safe. The cortisol releases in our body and we immediately want to return to the idea that we're, we're safe and we're going to be okay. So what do we have to do differently to allow that to happen? And in that moment, it's kind of like something can happen outside of us, but we're so young because this is usually between the, the years of zero and six or zero and seven. We don't understand that what's happening outside of us has nothing to do with us. Therefore, whatever is impacting, we're immediately going, what did I do? What do I need to do differently? What's wrong with me? How do I change this? And Before we even realize we've done it, we've already made a modification and decision about who we are and how we think we're supposed to behave. And that becomes part of our internalized self-image. And so everything we do starts to be reflected through this lens that we're now seeing life through as if, okay, 
I'm not good enough being one of the most unanimous ones that I've ever come across and working with hundreds of people is this idea that I will never be good enough. I always have to do these other things to make sure that maybe one day I might be good enough. And for women, we're notorious for that. I must, you know, serve to the point where I have nothing left for myself. You know, where does that really come from? It comes not only from the way that we're taught, perhaps generationally, it also comes from a lot of the ideas we formed about ourselves based on this idea of a foundational lie. Does that make sense? Wow, a lot of sense. I've never quite heard it put in that manner. And I'm tracing back, I'm thinking about myself, I'm thinking about my grandson who is seven, going to be eight, and it really makes a lot of sense. So Rev Deb, we when we are in those formative ages, uh, when we have children, grandchildren in those formative ages, it, we really should be careful about how we speak to them and give them opportunity to explore and be all right with failure. Is that what I hear you saying? Be all right with living? Is that what I hear you say? Yeah, we, we do need to to really allow uh, for, for to teach our children how to be more human and to realize that it's okay to be human and it's okay to have feelings and it's even okay to be afraid or think maybe they did something wrong. However, it's really important to affirm for them that, that they didn't do something wrong, that that wasn't necessarily their fault, that, that it's okay. That if that makes sense, it's like, you know, we teach children how to read and write and have arithmetic and, and social studies and all these things that, you know, are all very important to how we grow, but we never ever teach human beings how to be human Mm -hmm. and how to deal with the feelings and emotions. And what ends up happening at, you know, the Jesuits had it where they said, you know, show me a man at seven or show me a boy at seven. I'll show you the man. That's the reason they say that is because by the time you're seven, where your next sort of channels are turning on in your brain and you're starting to recognize, oh, there are things outside of myself that have nothing to do with me. You've already made so many decisions about who you're supposed to be and how you're supposed to be based on everything that's been fed to you, based on your reactions and responses to things that have happened to you. And then other people's reactions and responses to things that are happening around you, that I think the best thing we can do is begin to also break down the idea of emotion, feeling, being human, interaction, responsibility, accountability for children at a very young age. So they begin to understand that they are sovereign, that they they don't have to be all of these things, and that there really isn't anything wrong. And and, they, and if there is something wrong, it's it's not their fault, and it, and it can be adjusted. They have a choice in the matter. Help them understand. Mm -hmm. Help us all understand because we all need to do this. So especially, you know, for women in particular, it's like, you know, we have to stop being so hard on ourselves. It's very important. We have to to really start to look at why we might feel guilty because women have a tendency to feel very guilty about things that they're not doing or maybe they're not doing it the way they want to do it or they're not there for their kids or they're having to do, you know, there's a lot of guilt. We also need to look at things like shame. Mm. and and pain and blame because these are all things that have us playing very small because we think that's the safest way to be and the hardest thing is to be somebody that has big vision but doesn't know how to play big oh, yes. because they feel safest playing small that's probably what most of the common ground is in working with any of my clients is that's kind of where they're at. They have big vision, they have big heart, they really want to make a difference and they're making a difference to the best of their ability, but they don't know how to play big. It's it's not okay for them to play to play big. They, they're they apologizing somewhere along the way for something that they feel is not right within themselves. That's what we want to correct. That's a deep and a big spotlight. It's it really is, and I think more of us are playing and from that singing from that hymnal than we are from playing big and really just being who we are. Even when we would appear to be right there, we really, really aren't. Now this takes me on over to another thought. It looks like your focus is to help your clients attain the life uh, that they want, the business structure, the, just freedom from these preconceived ideas, notions, all these things that bind us. So what you offer is freedom. And I'm I'm wondering, will you tell us how do you give instant and permanent breakthroughs? Because I love the word breakthrough. It's mm-hmm. How does that happen working with you? 
So the instant and the permanent are, are slightly different animals because an instantaneous breakthrough is an awareness. It's an aha moment. It's like, oh my God, I never saw it that way before. I didn't think of it that way before. So that's really what an instant breakthrough is. It's like, ooh, look, let's put these two things together and how does that resonate? That's a really cool thing to do. And I offer instant breakthrough sessions with people so that we can meet each other and they can understand a little bit better what it means to work with someone like me. And we can see if it's the right fit and so forth. And just to help them have clarity. Uh, so that's kind of what an instant breakthrough is. A permanent breakthrough is the type of shift that, that we're talking about, which is literally realigning the nervous system. So we begin to understand, oh, what is that foundational lie I've been telling myself? Because if you could think of it like a frequency, if we turn on a radio, but we don't turn it up, there's still a frequency, right? We're just not hearing it, right? So you turn it on and there's a frequency running in the room because the radio is on, we're just not hearing it. That's very much how a foundational lie ends up playing out in our life. It grows into this beautiful thing we call a belief system. And that belief system is constantly echoing quietly in the back of our mind. And it's what we call autopilot as well. It's our nervous system starts to fire in a certain way. Our brain responds to that. Our neurons fire that way. And then all of a sudden we're saying yes to things and no to things. And the things we're saying no to are the things we really want. And the things we're saying yes to are the stuff that we really don't want. So when we're dealing with a permanent breakthrough, we're dealing with actually unwiring that, unraveling that, and then rechanneling it to become something that somebody really does want so that they can say yes to the things that they truly desire in their heart. And they also know how to say no to the things that no longer serve them. And it sounds like a form of therapy or something of the kind, except you are actually undoing something that you learned and mm -hmm. even buried it and it becomes automatic, your mm -hmm. response. Oh my goodness. Of course you can't give a time frame on something like that. It's it's different for everyone, I would imagine. Well, I have a process actually um, that goes over a course of, and it depends. I work with people differently. It just depends on what their accessibility is, how busy they are, et cetera, and, and how quickly they want to move things. Um, so I have a process though that can play out over a period of 16 weeks to actually make that transition. So it's, it's not that long mm -hmm. considering that it's a lifetime of belief system that we're actually dealing with. It's 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 one of those things I consider to be like instantaneous in, in its own right, uh, because it really is quick. And the way that I work, I, I work in the field of energy. So it's not just we're gonna mentally to me, therapy and and I'm a I am a fan of it. I have had a couple of amazing therapists in my life when I was much younger. They helped me deal with a few things and I'm very grateful for that. So when I say this, it is with all due respect to all practitioners out there. Um, and I find that a lot of, of practice deals with the mental. It deals with the mindset. And we've all heard the stuff that's like, what you think about, you bring about. You know, If you believe it, you can achieve it. And I agree with all of that. However, how you feel about what you think is really where I come in. Because you can think about something all day long and truly want it, but if your feelings can't align with it, if your feelings are shut down or aligned with fear or they're in fight or flight, then it makes it really hard for you to get that thing that you truly want or hang on to it. So that's where a lot of people get very close to the brass ring and they're reaching and reaching and they can just touch their fingers and then, oops, they drop it because they, they can't get there because their emotional life is not aligned with their mental. So when I work, I work with the mind and the emotion and the body and how the energy works and the spirit, if you will, uh, yeah. because to me, that's energy. It's frequency running through everything. So we want to align all of that. And it's repatterning. It's, ha it's having somebody be able to repattern themselves. Mm -hmm. Oh my. Yeah. We can't leave out this, the spiritual aspect of it no. because that just binds it all together and makes it all relevant. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking about people in general how so many of us need to be rewired. Can you imagine, do you take time to imagine what the world would be like, Our the leadership in this world would be like if people would take 16 weeks to just rewire and, and, and realign themselves? What, what do you see when you think about that? 
Well, that comes to my, you know, inspirational performance art and so forth that I do. Um, I am a recording artist. Um, I so I have a lot of music that I do. Uh, I I ha- do a lot of writing um, and and performance on that level and speaking and so forth. And so when you ask me, what do you see and how do you envision? For me, that's where that comes from. You know, the music that comes forth. I have a, a new album coming out soon, and one of the songs on it is called "We Can Change the World." Because we can, we can change the world. When we get past this idea, one of the lines is, you know, who am I? A simple, ordinary girl. Like how, how can I, but yet if I can look past the idea of believing that I'm small and recognize that I'm part of this huge, beautiful thing called life and this huge, beautiful thing called spirit, you know, and, 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 and realize that that's what we all are. If I can align with my brothers and sisters that way then there's nothing that we can't do. Mm. And to me, that brings compassion into the conversation. It brings humanity into the conversation and it brings stewardship into the conversation. I honestly, and and the biggest movement I am at this point starting to birth is this idea of stewardship and bringing it back to, we need to be stewards of ourselves and stewards of one another and stewards of this planet. We're in charge. We're the ones capable of really taking care of things. And so, you know, when I envision that, that's, that's when I envision us recognizing that we are sovereign and recognizing that we are interdependent, we need one another, and recognizing that it's not just human beings that need us. It's the forests and it's the, it's the animals, it's the oceans. We are responsible for these things. It's so much greater than just you and I. In the, because in the beginning, we were all connected. Everything was connected. Is that what I hear you say? Mm-hmm. So we have to go back. That's a part of our stewardship. When we are rewired, we realize all of this. Uh, Reverend Deb, are we going to get to this place where, you know, you hear with the with the vaccine, we hear about herd immunity. Are we going to reach that place as far as human beings, the herd immunity with rewired and, and our thoughts different? We take on the stewardship. We care about each other. And it, it, we're not looking beyond the dollar. We're looking beyond what I can give you, you can give me, and all of that. And we are really, do you see where we can really get there at least an inch at a time? I do. I, I have to say unequivocally, <laughs> good one, a little tongue twister. Yes, yes, I absolutely do believe that. Um, if I didn't, I, I, I don't know that anything that I'm doing in my life would make sense. Uh, so to me, it's my vocation and my calling. It's a, it's a faith. I have been called a Pollyanna for it, which I personally don't have any problems with. Um, you know, but, but the reality of it is, is that when we think about, can we really get there? One of the greatest realities is that I say it's, it's when just enough of us get there. I don't know exactly what that number is, but it's just enough. It is not like the seven to 8 billion people that were quite quickly approaching here have to all get there. It's just enough of us do. And then, you know, we lift up and then those lift up and then those lift up. And, and I, I do believe you're, you are correct. Um, you know, I, I love to say it this way. I mean, money is a friend of mine. It's very welcome in my life. It is, it is, the way we do business at this moment in time. And so having access to resources is important. However, I believe that greed is an issue. It's a problem. Mm -hmm. And I think that there's been too many values that have shifted into this idea of greed and power. And and we got to have all these things. We got to get here and we got to be up here somewhere because then we're safe. And um, and, and I do believe that that's one of the bigger issues at this moment in time is that there are people living up here somewhere that feel like they have to be there and we need to be someplace else in order for them to maintain and be safe. And none of that is true. That's a huge illusion and it can be quite damaging. And I'm not sure how far everybody's willing to go with all of this. Uh, but I do know that if this is what it takes for people to wake up and actually say, I'd like to do this differently, then this is what it takes. And people are waking up. That's my, that was my next question. When I think about what happened with uh, the all of the political uprisings, uh, 
Breonna Taylor, Trayvon Martin, Black Lives Matter, the Chicago 7, even when we look back at the Chicago 7, don't you think that those were instances where people decided to realign themselves with history and their thought and really not because the TV cameras were rolling or it, or it was popular, but because it was the right thing. And it, this is the position to take in life so that we can all move forward. Do you think that those are the, the uh, seed beds from which our, our alignment co can come and, and grow from? Does I that do. Make sense? Uh, it does. It makes sense. It, and yeah, I, I do think that we can look back and see when people have gathered together in the name of shifting something. And um, and we can learn from that. I don't know that we necessarily want to repeat what has already been done. Uh, I think that we have to learn how to do this differently. Um, and I want to be very careful how I talk about this because I, I am not a proponent of, of violence on any level. Uh, war does not work. I, it just doesn't. It never has. Yes, it has certainly taken stuff that's been, should we say, evil or bad and, and put an end to it. I, I'm not saying that it hasn't had its place. But if we look at, at stuff, war has never been the solution to anything. It just leads to more war and more unrest. So if we if we can look at what worked and what didn't work and take what worked and and add to that and i believe that part of that is being able to get together as as individuals coming together in community and beginning to vision beginning to discuss what what possibilities could exist beyond our immediate experience, things that maybe have never existed before. Mm -hmm. I started a project uh, a while ago now called Pieces on Peace. And what I wanted it to be was people all over the planet sending in their stories of how they would imagine peace to be. And I thought, oh, this will be a really cool project. And I could not get it off the ground. And I started to figure out why I couldn't get it off the ground. I had like a few submissions. And interestingly enough, they came from kids. Children were able to kind of send in their idea of what peace would be. But adults were like, that's a great idea. That's really cool. Sure, I'll send you a story. Well, I wouldn't get a story from them. I wouldn't. And I realized it's because we don't have a conversation, like an actual conversation about what peace actually looks like, because we have no idea about it. So we cannot talk about what we talk about every day and expect peace to happen. We actually have to create space for that future conversation and that future visioning. And I do think that that's how we will get there is by not looking back here anymore, but by looking forward and going, I can imagine this. What do you think about that? How could we possibly get there? And having somebody else go, well, I could imagine it being this way. And it may be far from our experience in this moment. However, that's how we create. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And get we keep the conversation going also. Mm -hmm. As long as people understand that there's an alternative, maybe we need to look at it another way. What about this? What harm is it going to cause if we do this? At a Would you say, uh, Rev Deb, if we do it on a grassroots level, that's where we start? If the I, smoke, get, if the, we start the fire, right. there's got to be some smoke. Yes. Yeah. And I think that's the way that it starts. I mean, from a little seed grows a mighty oak tree, right? So the grassroots level is awesome. Let's cultivate it beyond that, though. Let's use media. Let's use these channels that are available that can reach globally. Like we've never had access to the world like we do today. So the idea of something like this, it's it can happen so quickly when the message is out there and people are watching and listening and going, yeah, I believe this. And now they've got a call to action of something they can do. Um, I'm not a believer in, in saying, hey, let's go do this. And all right, see you there. Mm -hmm. I am a believer in saying, hey, let's go do this. So here's the next step. And I, I may not know it, but somebody else might and be able to say, okay, here's the next step. Here's what we can do next. I think we do need solutions. And I think they need to be simple steps that we can begin to take so that people do begin to feel like they have the power and the ability to be to make a difference. One of the biggest issues I think we have going on on the planet today, and certainly in North America, is that most people don't feel like they can make a difference at all. Yeah. yeah. And that's so not true. Yeah. So many people are just in survival mode. Mm -hmm. And when you stay stuck in survival mode, you can't even begin to think about 
anything but that. It's like exactly. our, keeping the food on the table, the lights on, staying in your home or your apartment. And that's a tragedy. That That is a tragedy. I'm thinking the conversations that have to keep, we have to keep these conversations going. You say that you have a new album coming mm-hmm. out and you are a uh, inspirational performance artist. Tell us mm-hmm. more about that. So, because I look upon these two entities as ways that people can stay inspired. They can keep the thought process open and move forward with you. I love that. Uh and they're welcome to have a conversation with me too. There's a way they can do that. Uh, so I'm working on, I have a one woman show. It's called Worthy and I'm revamping it right now. It needed some updating and I have the new album out and I want to kind of merge these things together. And um, the album is called Letting Go because uh, I. it's probably one of the biggest lessons in my life is really learning how to let go <laughs> and realize that, you know, um, I, I'm, I'm in charge of this. That's it. There, there is zero else that I'm in charge of other than this. So to be the best that I can be is the only choice that I really have to make every single day. And that makes life a whole lot, uh, more, uh, accessible to me. You know, and it also means that when people do have an idea or an opinion about that, you know, I have this saying that what you think of me is none of my business. So it doesn't mean that I I don't want to hear feedback. It just means that at the end of the day, everybody's entitled to to take what's true for them and to let go of the rest. So if you don't agree with me, that's cool. You don't have to. I respect that, right? So what you think of me is none of my business gives me the opportunity to be kind of free of all of that idea of, oh my gosh, what would they think of me or this or that? Um, and believe me, when I was younger, I was very concerned about, well, what do you think of me? And mm-hmm. what's that be? I mean, I was going on lots of auditions. So if you're ever not concerned about, you know, <laughs> I mean, you're like, am I saying the line the right way? Do I look the right way for the part? I mean, it's very much a lot of scrutiny. So to be in this place now is, is amazing. And so, um, yeah, I I will be relaunching the one woman show virtually, uh, starting about late May. So, getting into you know late spring and summer is when I'm going to start be doing a lot of virtual performances, uh, which I'm really looking forward to doing. It yes. is different. Uh, it's taken some getting used to uh, to be performing, and and you don't quite get the same feedback. You know, I love live. I love theater. <laughs> I love live concerts and performances. Uh, but I'm really, really thrilled to be able to serve in that way because, again, it's like a global reach that's instantaneously available. Yeah. So those are a couple of things that are coming very, very soon. They keep the conversation going. Mm-hmm. I, I, I'm listening to you and I'm thinking what we what you just discussed with me has to be discussed again and again and again until the energies uh, align and we begin to believe, I'm even saying for myself, begin to believe I can provoke some change. I can I can start right where I am. And we don't have to have the haves and the haves nots. And this, I'm not promoting that show or anything like that. But we can think about our lives, our world. We can be stewards. Mm-hmm. I think so. Thank you for positioning yourself and helping us position ourselves with you so that we can hear this conversation and make it applicable. I guess that's what I'm fishing around. How do we hear what you've imparted to us and apply it to our everyday lives, knowing that we are empowered? I can give you one really simple thing that anybody can do. And this is this is so simple. It is incredibly impactful. There is something called our emotional guidance system. We are born with it. We are not taught how to use it. We are born with it. So our emotional guidance system is not what we are thinking. It's what we are feeling. You may not know, your brain synapse actually runs all the way down around your heart and right to the top of your your tummy. So right to your top. So when they say trust your gut, they're not kidding (laughs) because you really do think all the way down to your gut. And so when you start to pay attention to how you feel, which is, okay, this is how I think. How do I feel? What do I think about? Well, how do I feel about that? This simple idea of just asking yourself, just even randomly, I have my clients actually set their alarm on their phone a few times during the day and make it the same as their ringer so that they don't go, oh yeah, that's it, that they actually have to check it. And on that, it says, how are 
how am I feeling? Or how are you feeling to make them actually go, Oh, how am I feeling? Because when you are feeling good to whatever degree that may be, when you are feeling good, you are headed in the right direction. You are headed to a place that is serving you. You are doing that, which is really your work to do. And when you are feeling less than that, so that might be confused, it might be exhausted, burnout is a big deal these days, it might be pain, it might be very noticeable, depression or so forth, um, to whatever degree you are feeling off track, not good, right, be it slight or significant, is really to the degree that you are headed off in a direction that is not yours, it is not your calling. It is not your place. It is not serving you. So this is the simplest step I know how to say to people right now. If you apply this, you will become very aware of what's actually running you at this moment in time. And you will at least begin to notice, hey, this feels good, but this really doesn't. Why am I doing this thing that doesn't feel good? Like, What could be the thing that could allow me to make me feel just a little bit better? And when I say good, I am not necessarily speaking about sunshine and lollipops and roses. And I'm just saying a little bit better than how it feels. So it's like, if you feel like you're in a pit right now, what's that thing that's going to make you feel like you just got a, like a foot higher? Yeah. That's what I'm talking about. And the more that we can connect to how we feel, the more that we begin to take responsibility for who we're being as well. That's how you get things done one moment at a time. Mm -hmm. I definitely am going to set mine. I, I can, hey, as soon as this conversation is over, I will be, uh, I will be starting. That makes a lot of sense because as humans, especially for men, and I think it's tragic that a lot of men are told to, or are groomed to not pay attention to their emotions. And uh, that, what a shame that is. Mm -hmm. Even some women, you know, or we we override our emotions so much because, well, they just get in the way. They just clutter things up, especially when we come from some uh, some career paths. The emotions have to go out. This is what it is. Mm -hmm. So well, it's not only that it's not only big boys don't cry, but it's also emotional women. I mean, oh, she's so emotional. That mm. is not a positive. Right? Yeah. We're, we're like, oh, that's not good. She's crazy. You know, or oh, it's her time of the month or whatever, you know, don't mean to offend anybody by saying that, but that's what we hear yeah. about being emotional. So being emotional is not safe on either side of this coin. Okay. And Glad it needs to up. become something that we can actually own because emotions are part of being human and we need to understand how, how this works. Yes. They're part of our barometer. Is that what I hear you say? Yes, very okay. much so. Wow. Ooh, I could go on. I tell you what, this is fascinating stuff to me. It really is. I, I had with, uh, so many questions. My paper is just full, but uh, <laughs> I tell you what, I think with your, with your explanation and your vision and your how to tip, let's just leave it right there. People need to get in contact with you. They need to have a conversation with you. They need to uh, be on the lookout for when you begin, begin the performances. Again, when the CD comes out, they need to be in your presence. So how do they find you, Rev Deb? Well, it's an interesting time for me right now, and uh, it's because I am kind of retooling a lot of things. So some of my website's up, some of it's down, um, so you have to bear with me, uh, but revdebbishop.com is one of the ways to get to a website where you will find me, um, and, and then also book Debra, and it's D-E-B-O-R-A-H, bookdebrabishop.com will actually put you directly onto my calendar bookdebrabishop.com and you can just book some time and we can chat whether you want to do an instant breakthrough or whether there's just something that you you want to know a little bit more information about and that's always up regardless of what is happening to the website right now uh, by the time that we hit about mid-april everything will calm down because everything will be up um so revdebbishop.com if, if you go there and you're like huh just bear with me uh, because technology, as much as I love it, it, it's one of those things that takes a little while to figure out. 
And, uh, and also I'm being really meticulous in what I'm doing right now. So I'm not really letting anybody else take the vision. I'm, I'm getting the first draft down. So I know that it's the way I want it to be. So please bear with me on that. But DebraBishop.com is there and BookDebraBishop.com will get you to my calendar. And those are two great ways. And of course, you can find me at um, Facebook as well. Uh, Debra Bishop's Place okay. is my uh, Facebook are you in well, this issue of Womel Magazine? I am. Lead? I okay. am. As far as I know, I am. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure <laughs> that I'm you not, are. But I, yeah, I, and I've been there. Like I said, I have been writing for Womel for just, I think, a couple of years at this point. And I, I intend to continue writing for as long as you will have me. Wow. Your voice is vital. And what you're doing, your work, your mission, your life's work is very vital. And never think that it's not moving the needle. There are people that are paying attention to what you're doing. And uh, I salute you. I really, really do. So thank you so much. My conversation with, I have waited for this conversation for so long. Reverend Deborah Bishop, Rev Deb, she told me I could call her Rev Deb, uh, permanent and instant breakthroughs and stewardship. You're just going to have to listen to the, uh, watch the conversation again, because this is next level thinking as far as I'm concerned. So I feel another question coming up, but I'm, I'm going to hold it off on all of that. <laughs> I am Margo Levette. Thank you again, Reverend Bishop. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for joining me. Appreciate oh, it's been you. such a pleasure. Thank you. I very much enjoyed being here. You're an excellent interviewer. Well, you know, this is my mission. This is my mission. And I I listened attentively when you talked about us being an alignment. So thank you. Thank you. That's proof of concept. Thank you, Lord. So I'm going to say until I, you'll see me again with another phenomenal woman and woman of influence. These women made the list, won't mail, won't lead. They were very meticulous. And the women that I'm bringing to you, they are all on this fabulous list. Don't follow them just for March. Follow them the rest of your days and you will not be disappointed. I'm Margo Levette. I'll see you at the next conversation. Bye-bye now. I want to thank you for listening to her business, her voice, her conversation. A couple of things that I want you to do right now, go to my website, pick up a copy of her business, her voice, her reinvention, how I went from game show hopping to international show host, author and speaker in one year. Number two. Please freely listen to each and every episode. Share them out with your family, friends, the men in your lives. And then number three, get in contact with me, one of the experts that have been on the show, because I want to make sure that you reinvent yourself. I'll be back next week with a brand new episode here on Her Business, Her Voice, Her Conversation. Her Conversation.